702. The Naked Sciences. 23 minutes to 3 o'clock. Already it's not the full half hour. So get your calls in right now. 011-883-0702 to chat to Dr. Chris Smith, the Naked Scientist, who's with us every Monday just after 2.30 to answer your science-related question. And as he's tweeted, science Q&A time, your science questions answered. What would you like to know? So much, Chris. Good afternoon. Hi, Azza. How are you doing? I'm very good, very good. Things are kind of feeling lighter, you know, after the misery of the past couple of months with Corona. So there's a different sentiment. You going into your autumn, we are heading towards spring and, you know, our numbers are different. Yeah, don't rub it in. (laughs) We, We have had an extraordinary summer, though. Uh, in the UK, you know, temperatures at 34, 35 degrees some days, very long periods of time with, with no rain. And then some parts of the country getting a month's rain in a day. Almost sounds like Johannesburg. Yeah. Uh, do, and also, we our winters have changed. Uh, our summers are different. It's almost as if you're watching climate change, but slowly, you know, with every passing season. That's what people are saying. Uh, If you looked at the footage of bits of Australia with people uh, throwing snowballs at each other this week, because down south, Mm -hmm. some parts of the country have have been deluged in snow. And uh, Mm -hmm. it happens once every 15 years or so, but they've they've certainly had a, a lot of snow. And as one commentator put it to me, really, it's almost every year now that we see a new record being broken when it comes to either a temperature or a rainfall or an extreme weather event. So this is probably going to be the pattern, isn't it? Along with coronavirus being the pattern and, you know, lockdowns being the pattern, more extreme weather events are going to be the pattern. Yeah, I mean, just last week, there was that story about the highest temperature um, ever reliably recorded on Earth. This was what in Death Valley, Mm. Death Valley National Park in California, 54.4 degrees. Uh, That's that's hot. Yeah, it is hot. And uh, I mean, it has been that hot in the past, almost. So this it's not like this is suddenly happened and we've never seen this before. Of course, we've seen high temperatures in the past. But what is happening is the pattern is changing. It's happening mm-hmm. more often. Previously, it was a very infrequent thing. Now it's becoming more frequent. And every year since the last 10, 15 years, we've seen some kind of record being broken on the climate scales. And uh, and, you know, and this is just really par for the course, I think. Yes. Well, let's get to the lines now that we've you know addressed the climate question. Let's go to Hannah. Hannah, I see that you're eight years old and you've got a question for Dr. Chris. Yes. You go ahead. Why, when you look at a spoon, you're upside down when you scoop the food? (laughs) Oh, Hannah, fantastic observation. And the reason for this is if you look at the spoon, it's actually a curved surface, isn't it? So when you look at it, you're looking at some parts of the spoon are further away from you than other parts of the spoon. And what happens is because of the curvature, it behaves a bit like a lens or a mirror. And so some bits of the light that go onto the surface of the spoon bounce off and are then reflected downwards. Some bits are reflected upwards, but the net effect is that it inverts the image because when the light hits the curved surface, the light going through right into the centre of the spoon comes straight back at you, but the light that's come from above hits the lower part of the spoon and is then reflected back upwards. And so you end up with the image flipping over. Effectively, the spoon focuses the light to just in front of the spoon and the the light rays go through that focal point and then spread out back towards your eye. But because they've gone through the point of focus and back out again, it has the effect of turning things upside down. And if we had to pound that spoon flat, it would be the right way up. Yeah, if you just had a normal mirror, (laughs) as in a flat surface, you wouldn't have it coming to a focal point in front of the spoon, so it wouldn't be inverting Mm -hmm. the image like that. You'd still see the apparent left-right swap, but that's just because basically the light is going to the mirror and coming back at you. Whereas with the spoon, because the spoon surface is curved, it behaves as though it's a lens focusing light to a point in front of the spoon. And the light going through that focal point means it comes from the top goes through the focal point and then goes downwards. And so what was at the top is now on the bottom. What was on the bottom is now on the top. Hannah, there's your answer. Happiness? Yes. Thank you for the call. 
Thank you. That's Hannah. Let's take a listen to this voice note. Hi there, Azania and Dr. Chris. A couple of weeks back, Chris was explaining what would happen to an astronaut if he was cast adrift from his spaceship and lost in space. I was thinking of that movie with Matt Damon called Martian. Chris said he would eventually die, stating that his front would be fried and his back would be frozen. It's a bit gruesome, but my question is what would happen to his body with that? Wouldn't the one cancel out the other and his body remain intact forever? Cheers, Abby. I'll listen on the radio. <laughs> oh, you got to love Abby's wit. <laughs> Chris, that's the full question. Yeah. Interesting question, interesting question. The Just to remind people, we were saying if an astronaut were cast adrift in space, I was making the point that some parts of space are very, very cold, nearly absolute zero. Other bits of space are very, very hot because there's incident radiation hitting them. And so I was making the point that if the astronaut were just not rotating, but one one side of the astronaut were pointing towards the sun, that part of the astronaut would be receiving lots of heat and lots of radiation, whereas the other side of the astronaut, facing deep space, would see a very cold universe spreading out behind them, and therefore there would be no energy coming in, very little, and lots of energy radiating away. So that surface of the astronaut would be exceedingly cold. In reality, as, as, as is being alluded to, you're going to get a, a sort of distribution of the energy within the astronaut. So uh, initially, there would be a, a frying effect on one side and a cooling effect on the other. I think that probably what's going to happen is that the spacesuit would carry on doing its job, at least for a while, to fend off the radiation, but not forever. And at that point, the spacesuit would probably begin to fail under the radiation, and then the radiation is going to hit what was left of the astronaut's body. But because there would be water, there would be some heat to start with, because it's not going to go cold immediately, it would probably turn a bit putrid first, beforehand. So basically, the radiation would then break through into a putrefying body, which was pretty cold by then, and, and then begin to basically burn the surface of a freezing cold object because the astronaut spacesuit is going to stop keeping the astronaut nice and warm and the astronaut will cool down to about the temperature of, of space except the once the spacesuit breaks down and that energy starts to come in then, then it will hit that cold tissue that's a bit putrid and, and basically burn away the surface of it slowly okay. i think um hard to yeah. say i don't think anyone's done the experiment but we we do know <laughs> that objects that are in space for a long time and are subject to relentless radiation from the sun that radiation is is sufficient to pound rocks to pieces on the moon because it keeps on mm. rubbing particles together so i think probably mm. that that's the answer it, it'll be fried and frozen at the same time at the same time great we've got jack in norwood hello jack Hello. Uh, I want to ask the doctor, the man who made the first clock, how did he know what the time was? <laughs> <laughs> well, actually, people have been keeping time for thousands of years, of course, and they kept time in a range of different ways. They knew that there was a, 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 a day because the sun rose and set, so that was an element of time. They knew that there were uh, years because they realised there's a, a repetition in the cycle of the seasons, for example. And if you totted all this lot up, you could therefore map that onto how the Earth must be going round the, the sun. That was the eventual recognition midway through uh, the last thousand years or so. So Copernicus actually was the person who finally put his head above the parapet on his deathbed and said, uh, I, I think actually the... Uh, earth is going around the sun and that explained an enormous amount but people already had a concept of time and they could measure time by using things that happened at a predictable rate in order to create an increment of time of course now we have a proper definition of time which which uh, is is um, actually what is a second and we've defined what a second is but back in back in the day people basically worked it out roughly and because a day still took the same amount of time each time, they could always get the day length right. But t clocks were notoriously unreliable until, you know, more relatively recently. Mm, process of refinement, I guess. Jack, thank you very much for that question. And next we have Patrick in Germiston. Afternoon, Patrick. Hey, guys. I wanted to know if the uh, Naked Scientist knows anything about the gene ABCC11. Mm. It says ABC. A D 
D for A for A for Apple, B for Barry, B. and then C C Charlie Charlie one, double one. one. I I don't know what that gene is. What is it? It's it's earwax. Oh, okay, is this the top. difference between dry and wet earwax? Yeah, they've they've um, located the gene responsible for it. Yeah, it's it's um, quite well known that different populations on yeah. Earth have different recipes for their earwax, and if you are in the uh, far east, for example, of Asian extraction, then you're more likely to have an earwax which is a drier consistency, and if you're of western extraction, you're more likely to have earwax which is a wetter consistency. And the fact that this was so reproducible argued that there was a genetic effect and people knew the gene. I'd not realised it was ABCC11, but uh, now I do, so thank you for educating me. And if you're of African extraction, want to know what my um, earwax I, is like? I, I don't know what the genotype is, but the answer is that mm. everybody derives their origin from Africa. So both of those genotypes must be in the African gene pool. Uh, so mm. I'd, I'd guess that there will be people who carry both types, but that's just a speculation. I'll have to check. All right. Yo, what an interesting question and a way of getting there. Next, we've got Jacob in Highlands North. Hi, Jacob. Hi, how are you? We're good. Welcome. So my first question is, why is it that some animal species have maternal slash paternal instincts and they look after the young, whereas some other animal species will like lay their eggs or like give birth to the young and then just leave the young to fend for themselves? Mm -hmm. The second question is, um, is a vegan diet actually sustainable to a human and especially a developing one, um, such as myself, age 15? (laughs) <laughs> all right great questions thank the, you, the nurturing instinct answer first and thank you for two great questions the thing is it will be whatever works evolutionarily speaking because the behavior that any creature has and its reproductive behavior especially is driven genetically and that behavior will have evolved in terms of what is the most successful strategy for that animal. And by successful strategy, what's the purpose of reproduction? It's to make more of yourself. And if you make more more of yourself or more, more things that come from you that carry your genes, then you're making more of your genes in the population. And therefore, if you have it set up so that uh, you have a, an animal where the best breeding strategy is that uh, one of the parents looks after the young and the other one doesn't, and that leads to more offspring more of the time, then it's a good strategy, and whatever genes make that happen, those genes will become more common in the population, so as a result, that becomes the behaviour. So that it's basically genes, genetics, and whatever makes that behaviour become the most, the most successful strategy for that particular creature. Uh, in humans... Two parents, two parents who both contribute to the upbringing of a child seems to be consistent with the best outcome for a child, both in terms of its emotional development, its educational development and and providing a a good environment for that child to to grow up in. But it's not uh, exclusively that case, because as we all know, there are some situations where you can't have two parents or you don't have two parents. So humans are very adaptable and we're able to compensate. We're also very social species, so we help each other out. Other animals, it's the male. Other animals, it's the female that does all the rearing or parenting. In some species, neither animal does that. And the the organism gives birth to young, which are very, what are called, precocious. They're very well developed and ready to go mm-hmm. from the get-go. But generally, those sorts of animals are simpler creatures that have a sort of pre-programmed lifestyle, like a spider, for example. M- animals that are uh, more intelligent and have a bigger brain uh, and take more time to develop tend to have parents that look after them for longer in order to Mm. enable them to to grow up. The other question is the vegan one. It Mm. it depends. A young person has a very high metabolic demand being placed on their body to grow. You can burn off a third of the calories that you take in in a day just making your body bigger. And not just bigger, but bigger. All these different complicated tissues with hundreds of different cell types are all trying to grow and they are putting an enormous chemical order in every day to provide the raw materials so that you can grow. There is a danger with any kind of diet, which is not a very broad mixed diet, that there could be micronutrient deficiencies. And what I mean by that is that some diets are 
low in the availability of some nutrients. And while an adult might be able to subsist on one of those diets because they have some stores in their body, which mean that they can overcome a a short term deficit in a nutrient or their demand for that particular nutrient is not that high. So a diet that's relatively poor in that nutrient, they'll get away with it. A growing individual has to be much more careful because their demand can can peak for certain things at one moment in time, especially things like iron, for example. And some diets are not very high in some of these nutrients. So if a person does decide to go down the route of eating a vegan diet, it is really important that they do it very sensibly, very carefully, and make sure that there are no apparent deficiencies in the nutrient status that they're eating. Uh, Getting some professional help, diet help, or following very careful, properly clinically informed guides would be very sensible because it's very easy with these sorts of things to follow your uh, heart and not look after your health because you have all the right aspirations and intentions but actually it can be a high price for your body to pay Mm. at a time when you really need not to be holding it back in its attempts to develop especially your your brain and Mm. studies have been done looking at the IQ points of young people and there were there were uh, comparisons made between individuals that were eating a vegetarian diet and individuals that were not eating a vegetarian diet and in some cases the individuals eating the vegetarian diet were iron deficient especially young women and when they were switched onto a diet with iron fortification their IQ increased by a number of IQ points. And this is because they they were starving their brain of the iron it needed to mobilise energy because iron's an important cofactor in metabolism. So nothing wrong with having a particular diet as long as you're very careful about making sure that diet contains all the right nutrients that a growing person needs. Right. Thank you for those questions, Jacob. Good day, Azania, and good day to the Nikkin scientists. My name is Mzwake. Azana, I would like to find out what is it that we see or I see for that matter. You know, when I close my eyes and then when I open them, I will see those small stars, glitters moving around. And I just hope that I'm not the only one who sees that. What (laughs) causes that? Thank you. (laughs) Mzwake, you are not the only one. Yeah. (laughs) Well, there's two things going on here. And um, one is that when you close your eyes in the dark in your bedroom at night and you see patterns, this is because your brain is tuned into the signals that are coming from your eye. And when the signals that are coming from your eye are cut off because your eye isn't generating any output because there's no light coming in, then the brain can sometimes start to invent images or imagery, partly because the signals trigger off neurological noise because there's no strong signals that are the real deal coming in. The retina also does this with areas of the retina not receiving much input because there's no light coming in. It can cause the retina to try to amplify the signal because it thinks well where where's the where's the signal gone? Why can I not see anything? And it turns up almost like turning up the volume on the radio and you get more hiss you get more neurological hiss in the retina. And so you can get little sparkles as well. And then there's another phenomenon, which is called Shearer's entoptic phenomenon. And this is where if you look at the sky on a very bright day, a nice brilliant blue sky, you might see silvery white stars just coming down and glittering in your vision and sometimes following a wiggly course across your eye. And what you're seeing there are white blood cells. Because in the back of the eye is a very rich plexus of blood vessels and the red blood cells that are in there, your eye is adapted to those because there's so many of them and they're flowing through all the time and they're very small. And so the retina has learned to ignore the red coloration of those red blood cells. Mm -hmm. But those red blood cells critically don't have any DNA in them and so they don't reflect other colours of light very well. But white blood cells are much bigger and they are nucleated. They have a nucleus containing DNA and that reflects back the other colours. And so when one of those goes through a blood vessel, it reflects off other colours of light, which your eye is not used to seeing all the time. And so it sparks off this white blob in your vision. 
So when you see this brilliant, nice, bright day, brilliant blue sky, and you stare up and you see these little uh, silvery white blobs, sometimes wandering in a wiggly pattern across your eye, that's uh, mm. the, the Shearer's Boy. blue entoptic phenomenon, and you are seeing your own white blood cells. Oh, beautiful. Always so fascinating, Chris, but we're out of time. We're going to bank all the remaining questions, and until next week. It was a pleasure. Thanks, Azan. Thanks, everyone. Great questions. 702 The Naked Sciences